Well, amen. Thank you, men. Good morning. It is a joy, always a joy, to be at Mims Baptist Church. This is one of my favorite places in all the world to come. And I come to you this morning just off the heels of a wonderful revival at the Cook Springs Baptist Church up in Huntsville, Texas. Boy, we had some of the best singing I've ever heard. It started on Saturday night with the Williamsons, and then the Mark Trammell Quartet was there Sunday morning and Sunday night and Monday night, and then Joseph Habedank was there Tuesday night, and the Neelands were there last night, and I got to preach you all of that, and it was just wonderful. And I'm so glad that God let us be there, and I'm glad God's let us be here today. And Brother Bill, it's always a joy to be with you. You always encourage and inspire and challenge me. And Brother David, I'm, I've never heard you preach that I didn't learn something that God wanted me to know, and I'm looking forward to that. Brother Jerry, thank you for inviting me back again. I appreciate that so very, very much. I love Brother Jerry, and I love Brother Fred. Brother Fred is a Clemson fan. Brother Jerry is an LSU fan. They are the Clemson Tigers. They are the LSU Tigers. And when I say go Tigers, they have to figure it out. Amen. That's not being a hypocrite. That's doing the best you can with what you have. Amen. Well, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Usually in these conferences, I go first. And I like to go first because then I can enjoy the message that follows mine. But uh, today I've been assigned this second spot right before lunch. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. If you have found it, say amen. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, and also you have received, wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. The word gospel appears in the New Testament 104 times in 96 different verses. It means good news. We live in a world of bad news. Every day we hear of war and bombings and shootings and stabbings and plane crashes and riots and political upheaval. We live in a world of bad news, but the gospel is good news. It's good news. Thank God for good news. When you read about it in the New Testament, it is referred to as the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of God, the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel of His Son, the gospel of peace, the gospel of the uncircumcision, the gospel of the circumcision, and the gospel of your salvation. It is also referred to as the everlasting gospel and the glorious gospel. The Apostle Paul, his whole Christian life was given to the gospel. He was completely wrapped up in the gospel. That's what his life was about. He said, I am separated unto the gospel. He said, I'm ready to preach the gospel. And he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And he had a stern warning for anyone who dared to preach another gospel. The gospel. When you read what Paul said about the gospel in, the, in his epistles, he talked about the beginning of the gospel. And the preparation of the gospel. And the mystery of the gospel. 
and the confirmation of the gospel and the defense of the gospel and the furtherance of the gospel and the faith of the gospel and the hope of the gospel and the truth of the gospel and the afflictions of the gospel. He talked about the bonds of the gospel and he talked about the blessing of the gospel and he talked about the dispensation of the gospel. He talked about the power of the gospel and he talked about fellowship in the gospel. A gospel, gospel man. The New Testament tells us that we're to hear the gospel and that we're to obey the gospel, and that we're to believe the gospel, and that we're to receive the gospel, and that we're to lose our lives for the gospel, and that we're to minister the gospel, and that we're to preach the gospel. In the New Testament, the gospel was for everybody, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. It was preached in the shanty slums of the poor, and it was preached in the palaces of kings. It was preached in the synagogues and in the marketplace, and from house to house, and at Mars Hill, and at the Sanhedrin. The gospel is not for a few, the gospel is for everybody. The clearest and most concise statement of the gospel is found in the verses that I read for you this morning out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. And I share with you very simply three things about this wonderful, profound truth that we call the gospel, the good news of God. First of all, the gospel is a specific message. Paul does not talk about a good news in general. He talks about a good news in particular. A man may have been sick for a long, long time, and all of a sudden, he begins to get well. That's good news, but that's not the gospel. A country may have been at war for a long time, and all of a sudden the flag of peace begins to wave. That's good news, but that's not the gospel. A person may have been without work for a long time. Maybe they're not knowing how they're going to continue to pay the bills. And all of a sudden they get a phone call, and they ask them, would you come and work for me? That's good news, but that's not the gospel. That's good news in general, but the gospel message is a very limited message. It's made up of three facets. Christ died for our sins, and he was buried, and he was raised again the third day according to the Scriptures. Jesus died for our sins. Jesus was buried. Jesus was raised again the third day. Would you say that with me? Jesus died for our sins. Jesus was buried. Jesus was raised again the third day. Day. Now, you have not only heard the gospel, you have spoken it from your lips. You have no excuse if you ever stand before God having never been saved. The gospel is a specific message. Christ died for our sins. We do not normally think of someone's death as being good news. I know some people, the first thing they do every morning is they go out in the yard, they pick up the paper, they come in, and they open it up to the obituary column. That's what they do every morning. Some people just need to get a life. But that's the highlight of their morning to see who died. But as you read through the obituary column, you don't ever say, I hope. You don't ever say, praise God. God, glory, he's gone. That's not what we normally think of as good news. But how could the death of someone like Jesus, the Son of God, who never sinned, how could his death be good news? Only for one reason. Because he died for our sins. Jesus Christ stepped out of heaven, came to this earth, and took all of our sin upon himself. He did not die for his own sin. The Bible says he had no sin. The Bible says he did no sin. The Bible says he knew no sin. It was for my sin and your sin that he died. The old song had it right. 
I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace. But Jesus, God's Son, took my place. Christ died for our sins, the lust, the greed, the anger, the bigotry, the hatred, all of the sins that we harbored in our own lives, Jesus took our sin, carried it to the cross, washed them away, and now we stand before him saved by his grace. And he was buried. That's what you do with dead people. You bury them. Right across there is a cemetery. I'll be over there sometime this afternoon paying honor and respect to Brother Gene and Miss Maveny. But that's what we do with dead people. We bury them. We don't hang them on the wall in the living room like you do a deer head. You do not hang them in the closet. You, When a person dies, you bury them. That's the proper way to put the body to rest. You bury them. And the Bible says Jesus was buried. He was placed in a tomb, and that tomb was sealed by the Roman government itself. And Jesus was as dead as death can make a person. He did not just pretend to be dead. He did not just appear to be dead. Jesus really, really died. Christ died for our sins, and he was buried. That's part of the gospel. Most of us do not think about going to the cemetery as being good news, but that's part of the good news that we bear. And then he said, and he was raised again the third day. Jesus Christ was dead, but he rose from the dead. I read about a man who was walking down the street passing a store that had artwork in it. And there was a little girl standing there, and she was just weeping, just a small little girl, and tears were pouring down her eyes. And the man looked to see what picture she was looking at, and it was a picture of Jesus hanging on the cross. You've seen those pictures, and I have as well. But this little girl was just standing there, weeping profusely. And the man said, Honey, are you all right? And she said, Sir, look, they killed him. They killed him. They killed him. They killed him. And the man was so overwhelmed, he could not speak a word. And so he just silently walked away and left that little girl standing there. All of a sudden, he heard the clippity-clop of little feet running down after him. And the little girl said, Hey, mister! Hey, mister! I forgot to tell you, he didn't stay dead! I tell you, he rose again the third day. There are eight people that the Bible tells us were raised from the dead. Three of them were in the Old Testament. Elijah raised a boy from the dead. Elisha raised one from the dead. And then after Elisha had died and been buried and the flesh rotted off of his bones, later on some men were carrying a dead man to bury him and they got afraid and they just threw him in Elijah's gra Elisha's grave. And when that man's dead body hit Elisha's dead bones, that man came back to life again. So those are the three experiences in the Old Testament of dead people coming back to life. In the New Testament, Jesus raised the, uh, the daughter of Jairus. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And Jesus raised the widow's son at the city of Nain. And then Paul preached so long one time, a fellow fell asleep and fell out of the window and killed him. And Paul went and raised him from the dead, which I think was a decent thing to do. And then, and then Peter, Peter raised Dorcas from the dead. But listen, all eight of those, those three in the Old Testament and those five in the New Testament, all eight of those who were dead and came back to life, they came back into the same situation they left. They came back in the same world. They came back in the same conditions. Nothing had changed. Some of them went back to school with the same kids. Some of them went back to work with the same people. Some of them went back home to live with the same family. But nothing had changed except they'd been dead and come back to life. But I want to tell you, because 
because Jesus was raised from the dead, he is the first fruits of our resurrection. And we have a better resurrection to look forward to because when we die and come back to life, we're not going to come back to this same world. Thank God we're going to be in heaven with Jesus. And there'll be no more sickness. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more death. We are expecting a better resurrection because Christ rose again the third day. Now, that's the message of the gospel. You don't have to add to it. You need not take from it. That's the full gospel. That's the true gospel. That's the everlasting gospel. Christ died for our sins, and he was buried, and he was raised the third day according to the Scriptures. The gospel is a specific message. Secondly, it is a scriptural message. He says, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And he was raised again the third day according to the Scriptures. The gospel is a scriptural message. I've heard some men stand and preach and claim to preach the Word of God, but they missed it. But when you preach the gospel, you are unquestionably preaching the Word of God. It was not a fable. It was not a myth. It is not an allegory. It was not dreamed up by Professor Poppycock. The gospel came directly from the heart and the mouth of God. Paul said, that which I preached unto you, I first of all received it. And he received it from Almighty God Him. Himself. The, the gospel is divine in origin. It is not man-made. It is God-made. It is God's message, and it is scriptural to preach the gospel. One last thing, and I'll be through. The pastor said, I could take as long as I want to take. I am. But I'm not in a long mood this morning. Lunch may not be quite ready, but you can fellowship or do whatever you want to do. I don't care. Go out there and buy those books. That'd be good. Buy those music. Amen. Amen. That's good <laughs> the gospel is a specific message. The gospel is a scriptural message. And the gospel is a saving message. Message. Paul said, wherein you are saved. Amen. The gospel is a saving message. You know, I can preach about creation, and I believe that God created the world in six days, just like the book of Genesis says. I believe that, and I preach that, but not very many folks are going to be saved as a result of hearing that. I can preach about the beauty of God's creation. I can preach about the wonder of creation. I can preach about the sun and the moon and the stars, and all of that would be true, but not many folks are going to be saved. But when you preach the Jesus died for our sins and he was buried and he was raised again the third day. I tell you the Holy Ghost of God somehow takes that message of the cross and the resurrection and he drives it into the heart of even the hardest sinner and that hardest sinner's heart will melt and the Holy Spirit of God will bring him to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. It is a saving message. Now if a person is going to be saved they have to hear the gospel. That's why we as Southern Baptists, and I am a Southern Baptist, and I'm not ashamed to be a Southern Baptist. That's why those of us who are Southern Baptists have 5,000 missionaries scattered all over the world. They're not out there talking about the wonders of the cooperative program. They're not out there talking about the glory of our seminaries. Those missionaries are out there in a world telling people about Jesus who died for their sin and was buried in a tomb and raised again the third day. And because people will never be saved until they first hear the gospel. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, and that's never changed. Never changed. And so if folks are going to be saved, they have to hear the gospel, and then they have to believe the gospel. They have to receive it into their life. That means they have to embrace it. It's not just mentally giving assent to it. It is embracing it, wrapping their arms around it, drawing it into their lives. This Christ that died for my sin, that's not just a matter of history. That's a matter of truth that has come into my life and changed my heart. 
They have to hear it and they have to believe it. And then he says, and they stand wherein you stand. He talked about preaching the gospel in vain. That means preaching without much result. I've preached the gospel in vain, and so have you, if you'll be honest. There have been people who've come down the aisle sometimes when you were preaching. They've come down the aisle sometimes when I was preaching, and they've made a profession of faith, and you never see them anymore. Sometimes people come down the aisle because a friend came down the aisle. Sometimes people come down the aisle to get somebody off their back. Old Sam Jones was a Methodist preacher, a Methodist evangelist, and he had great meetings and a lot of converts, and many of them were genuine converts. He said, one day I was walking down the street and there was an old drunk hanging on to a light post at the corner. And the drunk said, hey, you're, you're Sam Jones. And he said, yes. He said, I'm one of your converts. <laughs> and Sam Jones said, well, you must be mine. You're not God's. The gospel is not just a message that tickles our ears. The gospel is a message upon which we stand. We plant our life on it. I'm not trusting in water. I'm not trusting in theory. I'm trusting in the fact that Jesus Christ died for my sin. He was buried, and on the third day, he rose again. That's where I've put my roots. That's the foundation upon which I stand. It is a saving gospel. I'm looking out this morning and I see, I see some nice people. I really am. I, some of you I have, I've been coming to this conference now for 22 years and there are some of you uh, that I know very well. I don't remember all your names, but I sure do remember your faces. And I tell you, there are some of the nicest people I've ever met in all of my life right here in this room this morning, but you're not going to heaven because you're nice. There are some of you that are some of the most attractive people I've ever seen. I can't say that about everybody, but there are some of you that are very attractive. But you're not going to heaven because you're attractive or because you're not attractive. There are some of you that have gone to the absolute limits in the world of education. You have your Ph.D. degrees and you've got enough degrees to be a thermometer. And all, I mean, you've got all kinds of sheepskins on your wall, and that's good. I'm for that. But I'm telling you, you're not going to heaven because of that. There's some of you that are very talented. Man, some of you can sing, some of you can teach, some of you can give lots of money, some of you can do almost anything, but you're not going to heaven because you're multi-talented. If you're going to heaven, it's because you heard one day that Jesus died for your sins and that he was buried and that on the third day God raised him from the dead. You heard that gospel, you embraced that gospel, you received that gospel, and you planted your life on that gospel message. The Jesus of that message is now the Jesus that lives in your heart. Thank God for the gospel. Listen, men. I know there are pastors here. Listen, God has not called you to be a preacher of political propaganda. God has not called you to preach about the speculation of what may or may not happen. God has not called you to talk about things about which you have very little knowledge. God has called you to preach the gospel. Men, we ought to preach it. Singers, you ought to sing it. Christians, you ought to tell it. We ought to live it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And if we'll do that, we'll see people saved. Thank God for the gospel. Amen.